Charlie Wabrinskoy is vice chairman and director of research at Ariel Investments. In short, he's a value investor, so he's always looking for good deals. And Charlie, even the bears that we've had on recently say that at least in the short term, uh, this is the kind of market you can go in and find those deals in. Where do you see the biggest ones? Still in large cap quality. That's still the cheapest part of the market. A lot of these companies have a lot of cash. They're not earning any interest on that cash. So when they buy back their stock or they make an acquisition, it's almost always accretive. So we think we've got analysts that are anchoring on too low estimates. And these high quality companies are going to do better in the future. So it's not, I mean, it's surprising to hear everyone come out and say this. As I said, even the bears say this after the S&P's 97% surge since uh, the lows in March of 2009. Is it because the P hasn't gone high enough or is it because we're looking at uh, too low of an E going forward? I think it's the latter. I think that people are um, focusing on the earnings that uh, were in 2009 in the second worst economy in the last hundred years and they don't realize that the economy is coming back stronger. We've got a lot of productivity improvements across the economy. We've got a lot of growth internationally. If you're going to ask me one thing that people are underestimating, they're all focusing too much on North America, not really uh, realizing that these big companies have half their profits from overseas. And Charlie, we want to talk about some of those big companies that you like in just a moment, but I want to go back to kind of some of the macro th uh, themes we've been talking about, not just today, but really over the last uh, couple of weeks, if not the last month. And Adam, that's why I want to bring you in, because we've got another day of low volume here. Oh, I know. I mean, it's getting to the point, Carol, where I feel like we ought to ban saying low volume because it's every day. And I tell you, I got the ultimate chart for you. Hats go off to our producer, Jonah Davis, for this one. Look at this nugget, all right? S&P in white going up and up and up as the volume goes down and down and down. X marks the spot. I mean, it doesn't get any more obvious than that. And Charlie, I guess the question is, yeah, there may be value out there in the large cap names, but when you see a market that just keeps going up as the volume keeps going down, doesn't it make you a little nervous? You ask me this question every time I'm on, and I always say the same thing, absolutely not. The reason why the volume is going down is because there's less panic. People are less risk, they're less volatile. They're they're feeling better, they're feeling safer, and that tends to be when volatility goes down. When everybody's scared, volatility goes up. So as that, that risk aversion keeps coming down, as people get more comfortable with the market, the market goes up and volatility and volumes come down. What, what do you say, Charlie, we ask you this every time you come on as well, though, uh, about the headwinds here. You've got uncertainty, real uncertainty in the Middle East. You've got, obviously, the tragedy that hit uh, Asia through Japan. You've got the continuing crisis in Europe, and it looks worse, not better, every time we talk to you. I mean, aren't these things that you've got to be concerned about that, that make you risk averse? You're smiling, Charlie. Why? I am, because if I walked down any street in America, everybody would be able to list the things you just listed. They are widely understood and fully incorporated into this market, which is why we're only at 13 times earnings. If it wasn't for all of those things and we had a 0% T-bill rate, we'd be at 17 times earnings. So it's those well understood risks that keep the market as low as it is. Bob, you agree? Do you think that all of the well understood risks are already factored in here? Bob Iacchino. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I don't think. <laughs> we know it's a low volume. Think, we know it's a quiet everybody's day. Everybody's so chill now. Everybody's falling asleep here. We get well, it's it. We funny, get it. Because listen, I, I'm sitting here nodding, agreeing with Charlie on, on almost every single comment, and here's why. I don't think that the risks are understood in the market. I think what's keeping the retail investor and the regular investor off the street out of the market, which is helping with these low volumes, is that they don't understand and they have some indecision. Having said that, those of us that have been in the markets, including Charlie, I'm sure. Know Know that when the street starts to get in, that's when the market gets toppy. That's why you don't see these high volumes. The highest volume days have been on sell-offs in the mm. markets. They've been on panic. The market grinds higher and it collapses with high volume. So I'm agreeing with Charlie when I say that. The street, the, the retail investor, Main Street, is nervous. It doesn't matter to me how much volume is into a trade. If I buy something at a dollar and it goes up to two dollars, I've made a dollar. Whether it's traded ten times or a million times, it doesn't matter to me as a trader. Bob, good to get your thoughts. Thank you so much. Bob Iaccino out there, uh, founder and president of TraderOutlook.com. So, um, 
Charlie, let's bring you back into this because I do want to talk about specific names. You don't I'm not going to say you don't care about some of the macro trends, but you do really kind of hone in on good value plays that are out there. Uh, we talked about companies that have cash on their balance sheets and so on. A lot of the tech names fall into that. Microsoft is a name you continue to like. You've mentioned it several times on our air, but I mean, the stock's down about 7%. I mean, what are you banking on by buying into Microsoft at this point? Yeah, importantly, I have mentioned it before, but only relatively recently. We haven't owned Microsoft until pretty recently. And the reason is it was a stock that was overpriced. It was a stock that traded at a 25 PE. Mm -hmm. It has had perfectly good results, perfectly good growth, but the multiple has come all the way down to under 10 times earnings. And that's even before factoring in the cash. If you take into account the cash on the balance sheet, it's probably like nine times earnings. So they've still got excellent growth in emerging markets. They're in better position in the cloud than people think. They're actually in better position in mobile than people think. The Nokia deal is a very good deal. So we think it's not nearly as bad a company as its stock price would indicate. All right. So Charlie uh, laying out some of the good of Microsoft. Sheila, you're also looking at Microsoft. You've got kind of the good and bad of Microsoft. Yeah. And look, the bottom line is Charlie is in very good company. Microsoft may be a hotly debated stock, but there are plenty of bulls when it comes to Microsoft. In fact, if you take a look at analyst research ratings on a 29 buys from Microsoft, you know, all mentioning a lot of the same reasons Charlie talked about the enterprise refresh cycle, which is one of the reasons they have been posting such good results. Cash flow, of course, that newly initiated dividend. But here's the thing. If you've been waiting around in Microsoft for the long term. So talking about 10 years or so, you haven't done so well. The stock is actually down about 10 percent if you have been a long time holder. And, you know, as we go forward, Charlie, my question to you is this. You know, over the past 10 years when Microsoft was in its golden age with the operating system and with PCs, you know, really driving the market, how does it stand a chance going forward when we all know that PC sales are going down? And yes, they do have this deal with Nokia, but the reality is Microsoft is well behind Apple, Android, and all the other players out there when it comes to consumer devices like the phone and like the tablet. Why does it stand a chance? Because, first of all, PC sales are not going down. On a global basis, they're going up. They're going to go up dramatically internationally in emerging markets. Second of all, in enterprise, they are not losing share, significant share to Apple or Android. Their share remains remarkably strong. The total number of units of Windows next year will be higher than this year at higher prices. So there is actually real growth here despite the perception that the consumer has that Apple is taking big share from them. It's really just not true. What do you think about health care here? I mean, if you talk about uncertainty, you've got to really uh, raise an eyebrow when discussing health care, right? Because you had the reform law, and now you have the Republicans antsy um, to repeal it or at least uh, dry it out from funding. Where do you look there to invest? Yeah, it's unfortunately, I'm sort of uh, repeating myself here, but everybody hates health care because of what everybody already understands, which is all of the government restrictions and Obamacare and the like. But the fact of the matter is demand for health care, both in North America and around the world, is going to grow. Uh, j and J, Johnson Johnson, more than half the revenue comes from emerging markets. Demand for health care grows as per capita incomes grow. So we are going to get growth in health care spending, not cuts. And companies like J&J, which I do like a lot, Baxter, which I like a lot, St. Jude, which we like a lot, all have innovation, new products that are actually relatively cost effective compared to going to the hospital. So we are very bullish because these stocks are also very cheap. I just got to ask J&J, you're not concerned about all the recall issues? It seems never ending. <laughs> all right, Matt, what am I going to answer to that? It's well understood by the market. The well, headlines wait, wait. are everywhere. But Charlie, we don't that, know what the next yeah. one might be because it seems like give well, it a that, month right. and there's a new one from J&J. &J. No, that you're absolutely, look, the stock has not worked and I've been disappointed in the performance and I never would have thought this excellently well, actually managed company would have these kinds of, of events and I've been as upset as anybody has about the recurring recalls. But this is a good company and they are going to put these things behind them and long term, um, they've got great growth prospects. We got to run. Charlie, we love kicking around names and thoughts with you. Thank you so much. Charlie Borbinskoy. Thanks for having me on. Early Investments.